Psychologists, have you ever been genuinely scared by a patient before? What's your story? Not a psychologist, but my brother is. I will not, for the life of me, tell anyone this guy's name, and my brother told me about it because it kind of messed him up. My brother started his practice, ran from his house in the same city where I went to college. He worked with this guy who was in my class. We were both econ majors, and I saw him around all the time. He seemed pretty white bread. Wore tees and jeans all the time, headphones in, quiet. Only thing that was weird was he carried a laptop bag and a briefcase in addition to his backpack. He started seeing my brother about two months into freshman year. He came in for depression and went through some basic stuff. He didn't feel like he fit in. He didn't know how to talk to people. My brother said this all felt very rehearsed to him, like he seemed to be rattling it off from memory. After a few sessions, things changed. The guy says he sees things. He said he can't stand being alone in dark rooms. His roommate moved out of his dorm, so it made it worse. He said he sees things move when he's in the dark, small, almost imperceptible movements in the corner of his eye. He says he's scared all the time at night. This worried my brother because before then, it was just depression. Paranoia wasn't a good sign, and he started to think this guy was schizophrenic. The movements apparently got worse. Around late November, this guy started calling my brother's work phone which happened to be a cell that my brother kept on him at night. 2 a.m., almost like clockwork, this guy would call. Because my brother was afraid this guy's state might deteriorate, he answered the first ones. He said it was awful. His voice was strained. This guy was barely whispering into the phone, and he could hear the guy crying. It went on like this for days. Eventually, it got to the point where my brother, at their next in-person meeting, told him he needed to take off second semester and seriously consider inpatient care and that he needed to focus on other patients. He referred him to a health center and another psychologist who was more experienced with the serious cases. This guy cried in his office after being told that. He cried and apologized for over an hour, and he just kept saying, I'm so freaking scared. I never saw this guy after holiday break. My brother had a few more meetings with him, and he agreed to an inpatient care center after a talk with his parents. Four months later, it's April, my brother starts seeing lights outside his window at weird times. Not car lights, but like flashlights. He figured it was just Buzz College kids being insensitive. One night, he hears knocking on his door, like quick slams, but he ignores it. That same night, he gets a call, and he has since changed his policy for late night calls, so he ignores it. But it's the guy, he's screaming into the phone, They're back! They're back! They're back! And he says it faster and faster until he starts crying on speaker. And he says on the message, I'm outside, please let me in, please. Before the message ends, you can hear him slamming on my brother's front door. The guy didn't talk to my brother after that. We found out he decided to end it all three months later. Wait, what? That's frighteningly sad and scary. Kind of like how we felt for that little boy in the sixth sense. Story two. In clinicals, I interviewed a subject, mid-twenties, average, white male. The study was over something benign like temper and eating habits. He was calm and appeared normal, but the way he stared at me was increasingly uncomfortable and I couldn't figure out why. I just asked a series of questions. It was a peaceful setting. His responses were typical, except for one. I asked if he thought he was capable of ending someone in a fit of rage and without hesitation, his response was, no, I don't need a reason to end someone. Mid-sentence into the next question, I paused and asked him, did you mean you don't have a reason to end someone? And all he said was, nope. Then the edges of his mouth curled up and I realized why his stare made me so uncomfortable. I changed every third question to probe for more signs, but he knew what I was doing. He knew everything about me. The public uses the word sociopath loosely, also not a proper term, but it's extremely unlikely you'll ever actually meet one. It was terrifying. There was nothing human about this subject. It was like talking to a machine designed for hunting people. It was the only time I felt the presence of true evil, and it still haunts me. As far as I know, he's still out there. Story 3. Licensed counselor here. When I was interning in an outpatient dual diagnosis facility, I had a run-in with a person that had come to our program about three months out of prison with impulsive behavior issues prone to violent outbursts but it was typically verbal aggression in my experience with them. They threatened another client, which was grounds for immediate discharge from the program, but they left before we could tell them so. We notified police and locked the front door in case they decided to come back as they had also threatened a mother and her kid outside while waiting for their ride. So I go to the bathroom, which is down the hall from IT offices in a big medical office building. 
And on the way back, I hear this person coming down the stairs singing agitated, and they're going to give my supervisor a piece of their mind and maybe something else. The stairs are between me and the IT offices, so crap. I called out to them because we had been working together and had some rapport, thinking I'd get the other client to head start so they don't mind their scheduled appointment and get locked out with us in the hallway. I try to calm the person down, and they're not having it and super if down the hallway after about five minutes, not heeding my advice to take a walk and cool down first. I even offered to walk with them, but to no avail. They get to the door, and it's locked. They round on me and demand I open the door. I told them we didn't feel safe with them in the office, and the door would remain locked. The person gets inches from my face, telling and swearing, but no threats. I somehow remain calm and reiterate it would be a good idea to take a walk. They then made a vague threat about if we had met on the street, this would have gone differently and stormed off. It wasn't until I made it back to my desk and took a breath that I realized how terribly that could have gone. I had no backup, alone in the basement, our offices were the only ones on that floor, with an agitated person prone to violence. I'll never forget that experience. I work in a hospital now with impulsive and violent patients all the time, but there are always at least three people on hand to help if needed, and that was the most unsafe I have ever been on the job. Story 4. My brother-in-law is low-functioning autistic and blind. At one point, his care provider, who had worked with him for years and knew him quite well, got into a very dangerous situation with him. She had worked with him since he was smaller and had become experienced at interacting safely when he would become angry and aggressive. They found a good balance of medication for him and she let her guard down. This time, though, he was now 20 years old and 6 feet tall. In a split second, he charged at her, jumping up from the couch directly from across her chair. He was very strong and viciously aggressive. I found myself in tough situations with him, and I'm 6'4", 225 pounds. Afterwards, she was able to push away across the ground and get behind the couch he had been sitting on. She quickly slid the couch into a corner so that he wouldn't have a way around it easily, and she hid herself behind it and tried to be very quiet. He searched that corner of the room for over an hour following the front and side edges of the couch with his hands, back and forth pacing until he eventually lost interest and went to play with some toys off in the corner of the room. She got out of the corner and ran for her door just as her assistant was coming to remind her that she had gone over the allotted time. My brother-in-law is an amazing guy and I've had some awesome experiences with him over the years, but the idea of being hunted by sound like that is pretty freaky. Hold on, I've seen this scene more than once in actual Hollywood movies, and holy crap, it's got to be a whole other traumatizing experience to actually live it, right? Story 5. Good friend of mine's wife is a psychologist at a well-known prison and sees some seriously messed up people for a living. Let's just say Hannibal inspired her to do what she does for a living, and she's as close to Clarice as a person can probably get in real life. She's usually briefed on relevant details before she's assigned to a case. This includes court proceedings, testimonies, etc. She's heard recordings of disturbing stuff. She's tough as nails, and I guess she loves psychoanalyzing scary psychos. She had to be taken off a case because she was so uneasy, disturbed, and threatened by one of her clients. She couldn't give lots of details. But he has a victim profile, and she fits it. He started to behave strangely towards her, trying to converse with her and to get to know her. He would write her letters and draw her pictures and attempt to give her tokens and things. All the things he would do to his victims, well, everything possible under the circumstances. She was so upset and disturbed by his special attention that she was even afraid at the grocery store and started to feel uneasy in her home at night, despite the fact that this guy was locked up in a maximum security prison. She described it like a hunter vibe on a really weird level. She was taken off his case and received counseling. When she told me about it, she was very honest and matter-of-fact. This is a hazard of the job she works. While she may talk about her patients as if they are lab rats, this was one case you could tell really got under her skin and spooked her. Obviously, giving tokens and letters is not only creepy, but violates the doctor-patient relationship. She would decline very firmly and clearly, and I guess maybe some stuff was intercepted before he had the chance to try and actually give it to her. It's been about 10 years since I heard the story, but it just stuck with me. Story 6 therapist in training and my tutor, who is a childhood cruelty and trauma specialist, tell some horror stories. The one that stood out for this question was a guy in his mid-40s who had lived most of his life with extreme paranoia that his parents were sending people to get information from him to blackmail him with. This guy was extremely unstable and was legally obligated to go to therapy, 
after committing some petty theft because he believed his parents were tracking his money. Anyway, he'd been going for about six weeks, and he began to talk about a plan for the future. He was kind of vague, but said he had worked out a way to break free from his childhood and move forward. My tutor was apprehensive but hopeful. He had been making good progress in the previous sessions. Fast forward a week, and this guy is back again. He's noticeably agitated and carrying a large sports bag. My tutor remarks that she's pleased to see him and likes his new bag. He breaks down. He confesses that he has a machete in the bag and had planned to end everyone from his old life, starting with his therapist, so he could be free from his past, but she was very nice and would be hard to do it to. My tutor politely excused herself and called the police. The guy was very compliant, and he'd pretty much given up at that point, but the police confirmed he did indeed have a large machete in his bag, and his car was full of bin bags. She said that was the only time she felt she was close to passing away, and says the moral of the story is to treat all your clients well, because you never know who's plotting your demise. So that last sentence is basically good life advice, not just regarding clients, but people in general, right? Oh, and since you're already halfway through the video, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel, so you don't miss out on any of my upcoming videos. Thanks for that, and so let's go ahead and get back to the stories. Story 7. Not as psych, but I worked with parolees for a while as my first job. There's one guy that still sends shivers up my spine whenever I think about him. He came in straight from court and sometimes we didn't receive the details of the offenses before we met with him. This was one of those times. I called him into the office and started going through his paperwork, rules and restrictions of his order, how often he had to report, etc. He started requesting a male officer and stated that he hated females and got along better with men because they, quote, understood him. Now, at this point, I still didn't know what he had done to be on parole and he didn't want to disclose anything. He spent about 30 minutes talking about how he was the victim of the crime and that females had it out for him. He was very hostile and kept looking at me with a disgusted look and sat with his arms crossed. The paperwork finally came through about an hour into the meeting. He was on for some very, very serious and disgusting offenses against females. I then let him know that I had received the paperwork and asked him to discuss what had happened. We were asked to get their version of events. It was like something switched and he suddenly became very happy and almost proud of what he had done. He kept standing up and acting out what he had done in detail while smiling the whole time and asking me what I thought of it all. Without going into detail about his offenses, it was very graphic and hard to hear, and the fact that he appeared to be so proud of it was just chilling. He also kept asking whether I thought he was a victim of the crime and at one point asked me if I had any contact numbers for victim compensation for himself. Towards the end of the meeting, he was trying to charm me and kept asking me what time I was finishing work and whether I was parked nearby. I left with a group of my colleagues that day. He ended up back in jail about a month later, and while I am all for rehabilitation of offenders, I sincerely hope he stays in there. Hold up. WTF, how does someone like that get on parole in the first place? Like, did they charm their last parole officer? Thank the high heavens, that didn't work out on this lady, but come on, for reals, like, how, why was he even about to get out at all? It ain't like he was trying to mask his utter disgust for women either. It's a scary world out there. Story 8. I'm a psychologist now, but between undergraduate and graduate school, I worked at this facility with young male offenders for about two years, and it was the single worst period of my entire life. When I started, I generally had faith in the staff, and I really wanted to help the kids. It probably wasn't six weeks in before all the stress just got to me. The kids knew that most of the rules were not enforceable and they could constantly curse at us, threaten us, steal, break rules, manipulate the system, and act out with very few repercussions. I think it was my second day there when I saw a kid break down a steel door with a chair. They would provoke staff. They would provoke each other so they could force staff to intervene and try to get the staff in harm's way. What's worse, I'm a bit of a straightforward and by-the-book guy, and the kids started to learn that I would enforce the rules and they started to hate me and target me. I began to have chest pain on the drive to work. I would have trouble falling asleep at night because I would be imagining the threats and restraints the next day that I might be involved in. It does bad things to your psyche when someone can criticize you, make false allegations against you just to get you in trouble, lie to you, demean you and threaten you for months on end and you essentially can't even defend yourself because you're constrained by your role. You can't hit them back, talk back, show attitude, 
and the only tiles you can enforce or privileges you can take away, the kids could give a crap about. Meanwhile, you're giving them your everything, basic hygiene, school help, counseling, playing games, talking them through life issues, putting them to bed at night even. You're essentially their parent. But to answer the question, yeah, I was afraid of several of them. I was roughed up while I worked there. Two of them were relatively minor. We had lots of gang members too. They were all highly volatile. Story 9. Not a psychologist, but I used to have to escort jail inmates to sessions and sit in for them. They manipulate the living hell out of healthcare workers and I was legally not permitted to say a word about it during sessions. They'd scam for meds, try to get all sorts of legal favors, lie, and generally treated it like a vacation or field trip. In one instance, a guy who had been previously convicted had this shrink tearing up with his fake life story and agreeing to prescribe him a ton of different meds he really didn't need and write a strongly worded letter to the district attorney in his favor. After the shrink did so, it ended up not mattering because he was given an additional charge for doing something to another inmate who was wheelchair-bound. I recall the shrink, too, almost distraught, remarking to me that she couldn't believe such a nice guy would ever do that. I just responded that the guys I bring her aren't in full restraints on accident, and that I am lethally armed and armored during such escorts to protect her from them more than anything. I think that mental health care staff are good-natured and want to help, but naive as hell and are routinely scammed by dirtbags. I also think they tend to be a bit pompous and it gives them blind spots like a sort of I'm too smart to ever be taken for a ride by my patients mentality. Overall, I think they do a lot of good, but I think they need to realize some of their patients more than deserve everything that's happening to them and are not worth talking to at all. So I'm sure Sir here has seen a lot. And with all of that comes both the baggage and the experience of not being so gullible, if that's the right word. Interesting observation of his, though, about some healthcare workers being maybe a little bit too full of themselves to think they won't ever get fooled themselves. Let me know what you think or if I'm just completely on the wrong track. Story 10. Community mental health worker. Once had a client who had significant disassociative disorder, personality disorder, and oppositional defiant disorder. He was nearly 7 feet and 150 kilograms in the shade. His main trip was when you picked him up, he wanted you to change his incontinence aid, something that he was more than capable of doing himself, so all requests of that nature were politely declined. Picked him up one day in a Ford Festiva about the size of a Morris Minor on the inside. Asked him what he would like to do today, and he stated he wanted to go to the library and the bank. So we drove to the library and near the front, pulling up, he goes absolutely crazy, kicking and screaming, threatening violence. This guy was going to harm me. So I unclipped his seatbelt while simultaneously slamming the brakes on. He and his 150 kilograms lunged forward. As he tried to work out what had happened, I leant behind his body and undid the car door. As he started to move back and reposition himself in the seat, I shoved him out the door. As he was mostly out the door, I drove about 5 meters and stopped. He was so quick getting up and lunging toward the car, I floored it and went straight back to the office. My boss met me in the car park as an old mate had already rung through. First, my boss was like, are you okay? Jeez, man, what the hell happened? I'm six foot one and 90 kilograms and can take care of myself. But I was shaking and told him the story. My boss said, screw that guy and he was no longer part of the service we provided. For a few years after that, whenever I was in his suburb, I'd always have eyes in the back of my head. Story 11. Not a psychologist, but I had my brother in and out for a couple of years, and the daily visits were always something different. Few things I remember. Like the smell. Always stinking. Like, you know? Haven't had a wash in a week type of smell. Never got used to it. The characters. My bro was pretty chill compared to the rest. But a few standouts were his mate Steve and my bro's worst enemy, Snacks. Steve, absolutely harmless, but through years of cruelty, both mental and physical, Then a road paved with hard substances, he was way off center. He would throw fireballs and kamiyamihas all day. He would hide behind a bush, charge one up, and let fly at the nurse he was beefing with. Sound effects and all, and if 30 of those wouldn't work, he would find a better vantage point and start ripping arrows. Would do yoga, speak to crows, and fill me in on chakras and spirit bombs. Snacks, not sure how old she was or what exactly was wrong with her, but it definitely wasn't good. Couldn't really speak and she had a condition where she wouldn't stop eating, constantly stealing food from others. 
We would regularly visit my bro and bring food for him, and a few times she would try to steal it or constantly hover around, so I felt sorry and used to grab extra cheeseburgers. As I was going to offer her some one day, the nurse quickly stopped me and told me not to as it could make her go nuts. She was my brother's worst enemy because he went to his cupboard to grab biscuits and they're gone and he followed the crumbs to her bed. I felt sorry for all of them there. They could tell my brother was loved and cared for, but so many are lost in their heads with no family or friends or visits from anyone. They go from meal to meds, meal to meds, riding a roller coaster of imbalance and instability. It was, it was heartbreaking to see. All right, if you were moved by any of these stories, here's another one. YouTube thinks you're going to love it. I'll catch you in that video and thank you for watching this one.